7, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. The United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. America had been shocked and disheartened. Our government turned to one man to orchestrate our response. That man was James Doolittle. He was born just a month after the historical election of President McKinley. This election was a pivotal point in the U.S. economy because it just followed the wake of the Industrial Revolution. Doolittle was born in Alameda, California on the 14th of December, 1896. However, his family moved to Nome, Alaska. Alaska is the home to a very unwelcoming climate, let alone the fact that he was a child born into the era of the Great Depression. Like most men, Doolittle's upbringing honed his strengths. He was a man of strategy. In America's time of need, he suggested a brilliant yet seemingly impossible plan, the Doolittle Raid. Doolittle returned to Los Angeles to complete his high school education. He was then accepted to UC Berkeley where he studied in the School of Mines, a precursor to engineering. During his college education, Doolittle enlisted as a flying cadet, and after completing his training, he remained as an instructor. In one story even, it is told that while doing a flight demonstration, Doolittle broke both of his ankles, but persevered, enduring the pain, and willed himself to finish the demonstration. Doolittle returned to Berkeley to finish his engineering degree. He later completed his master's degree at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. After World War I, Doolittle earned distinction for his flying achievement. He completed a degree in aeronautics. In 1929, Doolittle became the first pilot to fly on instruments alone. In other words, flying without windows. Next to the Doolittle Raid, this is one of his most significant achievements. Doolittle was also the leader of Shell Oil, where he took part in developing a 100 octane, or airplane fuel, and he set the high speed land record. He held a variety of leadership positions in the scientific community and served as a consultant to Europe regarding the build of military air force prior to World War II's preparation. Before World War II, America was a nationalist country, staying within its own borders, trying to avoid conflict. America's philosophy was, everyone mind their own business. Simply putting it, America felt that they did not have to deal with the problems in the East. America's philosophy dramatically changed when it was forced into reality because of Pearl Harbor. America had never suffered an attack like this before. In America's critical situation, there was a desperate need for a hero. Doolittle was the only man who could answer this call. With Doolittle's analytical and courageous heart, he was the only man who can lead this suicidal mission with success. Through his experiences, upbringing, and life-shaping education in California, James Doolittle changed history in favor of the United States. His life in California ultimately guided him to become the man he became, a man who would create and lead a task that would bring hope back to America. If Doolittle never became who he became, the raid might have never succeeded. If the Doolittle raid had never succeeded, America's hope may have never been restored. The following radio broadcast was aired in the 1940s. On the president's order, the bitter taste of war was returned to Japan. We fashioned a daring scheme to have the Hornet launch a force of bombers and strike at Tokyo from the sea. All the volunteers for this secret and hazardous job had been specially trained by Colonel Jimmy Doolittle. While under destroyer escort, the 80 Tokyo Raiders held a deck ceremony with Japanese medals. Doolittle fastened one of these to a 500-pound bomb. The medals were going to be returned with interest. Lashed to the flight deck, the 16 B-25s had a rough voyage. Hoping to reach a takeoff point 450 miles from Japan, but ready to start in event of discovery, the crews kept fit. They were discovered. After avoiding two enemy patrol vessels, the task force realized they were sighted by a Japanese picket boat. The Hornet's escort promptly sank. Since secrecy had been compromised and fearing an alarm all over Japan, Doolittle, forced into the decision, ordered the planes to be launched. This was 800 instead of 450 miles from Tokyo and 10 hours earlier than planned. 
spite of the last second change, preparations went according to rehearsal. Only 467 feet of clear deck faced Doolittle's lead ship. The rest barely had room in which to rev up, and the last plane hung precariously out over the stern of the Hornet. After the wind-up by the flight officer, Doolittle made his run down the plunging deck. With a hundred feet to spare, he led the parade. Tension eased a little once the colonel was in the air. and cheered as one plane after another screamed down the swaying runway. In the excitement, this pilot started without lowering his flaps. His plane ran off the deck, dropped sharply, but expert piloting saved it. fully loaded medium bombers had never been done before. When the decks of the flagship were cleared, Admiral Halsey signaled to Colonel Doolittle and his gallant command, good luck and God bless you. Tokyo, oddly enough, had just completed an air raid drill. Their patrol boat had warned the city, but the attack was expected the next day. Therefore, the Jap war machine rolled on, unmindful of the approaching eagle. Target factories were churning out munitions tagged for Corregidor, Midway, and Dutch Harbor. Secure behind their Pacific fortress, and confident of an early victory, they discounted America's ability to fight back. Thus, the bombers were virtually unopposed as they flew on the deck. They swept in over the coast on their way to Tokyo. Elements separated and some climbed to 1,500 feet for the bombing. At 12.15, the attack was opened by Doolittle, who dove in before he unloaded his incendiaries upon the Japanese capital. One after another, they checked off their targets. Tank factory, shipyard, docks, railroad yards, steel plant, gunpowder factory. As the raiders left Tokyo with a broad trail of flame and smoke in their wake, Japan tasted war. The raid was but an omen of the eventual destruction to be heaped on Japan from the skies. As Doolittle later promised, We're going back to Tokyo, and we shall go in full array and with mighty allies. After the war, Doolittle returned to civilian life. He remained at Shell Oil as a company leader and still served as the scientific consultant for the USAF. Doolittle received not only awards from the US, but also those from the Allied forces. His most prestigious was the Congressional Medal of Honor, presented to him by President Roosevelt. Today in his honor, the James H. Doolittle Award is given for outstanding accomplishment in technical managing or engineering achievement in aerospace technology. Doolittle died in Monterey, California in 1993. Doolittle was a hero, a visionary, a patriot, and a leader. His life's achievements demonstrate the impact that one man can have when he has prepared himself to serve in the times he lives in. His example is a lesson for all of us.